Hey, how are you doing? All right, good morning, everybody. Happy day. It's Sunday, amen. It's time to start church. Let's get a song book. Turn to page 195. 195, let's all stand, let's sing together. Page 195. Glory to his name. Everybody, Amen. let's get a book, let's stand, and let's sing on the first verse. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood of blind. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name.
right beside it come thou fount of every blessing that's good singing let's keep it up as we sing this great song. Three, 507 come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy great streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood oh to grace Amen. great a debtor daily I'm constrained to better by my wandering heart to thee prone to wonder Lord I feel it prone to leave the God I love here's my heart take and seal it seal it for thy course above Amen that's good singing this morning Brother Tim why don't you lead us in prayer Amen. All right, you may be seated. Good to see you this morning. Good to be seen. Amen. Amen. You know, I, I as a pastor of this church, then uh, I have to give an account one day at the judgment seat of Christ for how I did the people that God entrusted me with. And that's how sometimes we have to preach things that are difficult, not always uh, tinkling our ears and sounding real nice, but we still have to do that. And it's also my job when someone comes along and uh, uh, someone maybe you know, maybe a loved one or a friend that wants to tell you a uh, false gospel, it's my job to tell you don't believe that stuff. So when someone comes along and they say, you know, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all. When they say that doesn't apply to us, they're a liar. It does apply to us. And uh, what you do when someone greets you like that and wants to talk Bible doctrine to you that is contrary from what this man or this man has taught you, then kindly tell them to shut up. 
or say, let's go talk to my pastor about it. But you know, you folks, most of you folks are well indoctrinated in the truth, and you're able to defend, and we don't have to defend this Bible, it defends itself, but you're able to stand up for what you believe and talk to people about it, and I appreciate that. But uh, no, no, I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. You say, I don't know what that is. Well, you're lucky. You don't need to know what it is. It's, it's just where they, they take the grace of God way beyond to where everything's grace, grace, grace. There's, when you got saved, that was it. You don't need to repent or confess. Well, that's a lie, because we do sin. <laughs> I don't care, I don't care. You do sin. I do sin. And when I sin, I have to confess my sin. I have to repent of my sin. Are we on board with that? You say, well, I'm a hyper-dispensationist. Well, see if you can find a church where they preach that. Because you're going to have a hard time finding one where they do. You'd have to go online and listen to Zoom preaching if you want to believe that junk. We don't believe it here. Well, that's good preaching right off the bat. Man, I'm getting wound up for my preaching message. We got a VBS meeting right after church. It's very important that we come. Wow, I'm excited about VBS. I walked by it the other day where we're going to be, and I stopped and prayed at the site where we're going to be and just prayed that God would bless us with some children. Uh, this, this, is, this is an act of faith we're doing this year to do it at a park. And, uh, but uh, usually, and the weather is, I mean, Lord, thank you. The weather is just, it's going to be perfect this week. The humidity is out of here. It won't be sticky. It'll be nice. And uh, it'll be a good, it won't be no excuse as far as weather goes for them not to be there. So, but we're going to need help. We need help with tables, chairs. We need to take some with us. There's not enough down there. And so we'll have to load the van up. We load the van up one night. We won't have to unload it uh, when we come back to church. But then we'll have to unload it the next morning or the next afternoon when we get there. So snacks, everything that you bring, workers, all that. It's going to be a hard week, labor-wise, but uh, I think it'll be worth it in the end. Like John said, if one could be saved, just one, then it'd been worth having the whole week for. And uh, <clears throat> if no one gets saved by Friday, I'll have one of these kids. I'll tell them to go get saved again, <laughs> and uh, we'll do it again. Father's Day is next Sunday. I've got a nice gift for all the men. And uh, you say, what is it? I'm not telling you, but it's a, it's a practical gift, amen, that you can use. It's not a knife. You'll be glad to know, no knives this year. Some of you have so many knives anyway. But uh, Father's Day is next Sunday, and the ladies are fixing us breakfast next Sunday. And uh, listen, there's going to be some casseroles. Now, men, look, these casseroles are going to be filled with bacon and sausage, and it's just like... It, they're going to be good, but I've already ordered a, a side of bacon, so uh, so don't, you know, yeah, we're going to have bacon separate, and so just for, so we have meat, amen, we've got to have meat, you can't be a, a man without meat, I don't want, I don't want veggies, I don't want fruit, I could care less about fruit, at, he, what is, that sounds communist, Quiche? No, I don't want that either. Amen. But we need to know what dads are coming, so they'll know how many to fix for. So a few dads, and, and now we opened it up for the ladies, didn't we not? You didn't have to be a mother, so we'll open it up that way for the men too. So all you, if you're male, I'm telling you today, there are some people that don't know. It is a mess. I might mention that in my message today. I'm not going to try to be ugly, but there's some that don't know if they're male or female. I have a real simple solution for that, but I can't say it behind here. So, John, do something with this. Put it over there. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm red. The other, the other sign up. The other sign up. Oh, for the ladies. What's that for? Oh, for the ladies that are going to come and help. So, and ladies, you get to eat too. I mean, there's always plenty of food, so it'd be good just the whole church came. Amen. Amen. And, uh...
we'll just have a good time next week. And uh, tonight, Brother Tim will be preaching tonight. His family will be singing. Y'all gonna come back to hear that? Uh -huh. Okay, good. Got three hands raised. That's good. <laughs> they love you, Tim. Yeah. yeah. And then next Sunday, you don't want to miss now, next Sunday, Father's Day, but Sunday night, John Mitchell's coming. He called me and asked if he could come for Father's Day night, and I absolutely said yes. So he will be here next Sunday night. And uh, I don't know if any of you remember Ken Day from back in the days, back in the 70s, when uh, Rick and Jeff uh, and Doug all came to school here, uh, but uh, he passed away, and they're having a service for him at Fellowship Baptist on Friday at 10 o'clock is visitation, 11 o'clock is the funeral. He is the father-in-law to the girl we've been praying for, Angie Day. That's her father-in-law that passed, and she's on the, she's in the hospital, matter of fact, had to be rushed back up there to Columbus. So just a lot going on in that family. And if you can't go say a prayer for the Day family, that'd be real good. But uh, amen. Well, we're glad you're here this morning. I think what we'll do is have the choir come up and sing this good song. We're going to smile. The choir is, if you smile, be helpful. We're going to every now and then maybe raise a hand. Be good if you did the same. And uh, let's enjoy the Lord this morning. Are you for that? Amen. Well, let's enjoy the Lord because this is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And that's what we want to do today.
Thank you. You may be seated. Let's have the ushers come. <clears throat> Take up this morning's offering. Father, we sure do thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give this morning. I pray you bless, Lord, each gift and, Lord, each giver. And have your hand upon, Lord, what we do with this money. Amen. I pray you lead, guide, and direct us. We'd only spend it in places, Lord, you'd want it to be spent. And I love you and thank you for the day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. on the cross two thieves hung by his side and one of them cried save yourself and us if you're the Christ and then the other turned to Jesus and made this humble plea Lord when you come into your kingdom please remember me and then he passed from death to life and woke up in paradise dressed in a robe of white washed in that cleansing flood and sang a song that no angel sings thank god i've been redeemed i'm safe with every sin beneath the shelter of his blood now i don't have to worry when death comes calling me and then I'll pass from death to life And wake up in paradise Dressed in a robe of white Washed in that cleansing flood And sang a song that no angel sings Thank God I've been redeemed I'm safe with every sin beneath The shelter of His blood Yes, I'm safe with every sin beneath The shelter of His blood Turns his face 
sway has wounds which mar the chosen one bring any sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers here was my sin that held him there until it was a his dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no. should I get a reward? My lamb, what a great song that, that is. That's a great song, great message in that song. I hope it spoke to you this morning. Let's turn to the book of Joel, if you would please. Now you say, is that in the Bible? Yes. I'm not on. There I am. All right. Give me juice, Jesse. That's uh, right after, uh, if you go to Daniel, you can find Daniel, that's a big book. Then Hosea, then Joel, it's right there. So look for the book of Daniel. That's got 30-some chapters in it. That's in the Old Testament. <laughs> Amen. I want, I want everybody to get to Joel. I want to read some verses out of here. I started preparing this message for Sunday night last week. And uh, as I was preparing it, the Lord spoke to me and said, you know, that, that'd be a pretty good message to preach on Sunday. And uh, I thought, Lord, this is really a Sunday night message. And he said, no, I think it needs to be a Sunday morning message. And so here we are, Sunday morning in the book of Joel in chapter 1. How many's there? Good, let's read. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation, that which the palmer word worm hath left, hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut out from your mouth. 
For a nation has come up upon my land, strong without number, whose teeth are like the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. I'll stop right there. We're going we're to cover the whole chapter, but we don't need to read the whole chapter. When uh, we first moved into our house over here, 122 West Warren Street, we noticed that the floor in the back bedroom was leaning. I mean, it was a bad, uh, bad slope to it. And when we went downstairs, everything in that big beam that was holding it looked all right until I hit it with a hammer. And when I hit it with a hammer, it just disintegrated. And what happened was termites had taken over that wood and it became rotten. You really couldn't see it from the outside. It was what was in the inside that made the difference in that beam. So we got some floor jacks and uh, we jacked the floor up and put some cinder block in there and we got it to where now you can lay in that bed and not roll out of bed. So it, it's close enough Amen for whoever stays there. But termites can do terrible, terrible damage. Amen. We had to call the Terminex people. They come in, put stuff in the yard, and, and put down stakes, and then they went downstairs. And, and I thank God we haven't seen termites since. Uh, but I'm telling you, they can cause a lot of damage if you don't deal with them. Now here in this passage, we see these animals. The palmer worm, that is a moth, if you look it up in the dictionary. The locust, we know what that is. Uh, the canker worm, the caterpillar, uh, these are primarily the same animal, and they consume the, the buds of leaves. And these animals, amen, uh, uh, are, are, were terrible animals that were eating everything, that were destroying everything. And sin, let me say, is a terrible thing. And sin can eat away at our spiritual life. And sin can cause us to collapse even though no one can see it from the outside. I want to preach on the wages of sin. The wages of sin. These four critters that we read in this Bible, now you say, what does the palmer worm and the locust and the canker worm and the caterpillar, what does that have to do with the children of Israel? Listen, Joel was given a prophecy here. There's not a whole lot said about Joel. There's even less said about his father, Pethuel. But we do know that Joel was a prophet uh, and he prophesied to the southern kingdom of Judah during the reign of Joash. And what Joel was telling them uh, uh, was a lesson of what sin can do if we don't get it right in their hearts. That palmer worm, that locust, that canker worm, that caterpillar, they ate it all up. And it's showing, this opening chapter shows us the danger of not a lap. Are you listening? Danger of showing us of what will happen if we do not let God deal with our sin and I said earlier today we're all sinners I'm a saved sinner but I still sin I have problems sin resides in the flesh can I get an amen I get hearing things I get to seeing things and you know what I rise up in indignation I get upset I, I, you can get upset to the point to where you sin. And if you just lay that in there and don't take care of it with God and let it blister in there and grow in there, it won't be long till, amen, it won't be long till your life collapses. And people around you say, man, I didn't see that coming. That's because it's not noticed so much. You can be in here with your nice little dress on, amen, in your nice little suit and look real sweet in here this morning and inside of you, you could be rottening away. That's why it's important, amen, that we take a look, we step back and we look and let God, amen, work in our lives. I want to say number one this morning that sin destroys. 
Sin destroys. I like how this book opened. It said the word of the Lord. I'm telling you, it was the word of the Lord. Joel clearly declares in his first sentence that this is a message from God. This is not a message from me. This is not what I feel about a subject. This is a message from God. And you need, listen, uh, he said to his people, you need to listen up. In verse 2, he said, hear this. Hey, listen, we need to listen. Amen. We need to pay attention to what God has to say to us. I want you to look at that verse 2 and in its entirety it said, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Let me interpret that for you this morning. Your, uh, the interpretation of this is, you've never seen it like this before. That's exactly what it's saying. We're seeing things today that we have never seen before in our lifetime. And I'm going to go right off and hit it, and I'm going I'm to hit this, and I, I, I know you're not guilty of it, but I'm telling you, I went to a Reds game uh, uh, on uh, Friday. We were given some tickets, and right in the big screen they had... Uh, Barry Larkin, and they had this other dude, and they had another woman, and they were celebrating Pride Month at the stadium. And it made me sick to see their hat, the Reds hat, with uh, the rainbow colors on the band of it, and to know that Barry Larkin, amen, and I like Barry Larkin. He, he was one of the great red players of the past, but I'm telling you, he's made a big mistake. He said, well, if he didn't endorse it, they'd fire him. Do you think that he really needs the money to announce home games only at the Reds? No, he doesn't need that money. And anybody with any kind of a backbone uh, would have stood up and said, No, I'm not going to endorse that thing. Amen. Pride Month. And the guy, they, hey, all, all they had to done was just have this guy stand before the camera with nobody else. And you know what he was. I mean, do you have to second guess when you look at certain people to know what they is? I mean, we knew this guy was sodomite as soon as he stood up there. Amen. He had all the attributes. He had the nice little sweet talk. Amen. He had, I'm telling you, you know what I'm talking about. And they were honoring this guy. In front of, there's 20,000 people at that game. They were honoring this man for the work that he's done for the gays and the sodomites. I say, fooey on that stuff. Somebody should have stood up and said, buke you. Instead of lifting it up and you're supposed to be happy about it and, and thrill, He also organized the King's Island Gay Day and the, the, the parade in Cincinnati. Oh, I'm telling you what, son. I don't, I'm not happy about that stuff at all. No, sir, going around here parading all that. Men with men, women with women. I'm telling you, it's sick. God said it was sick. God's against it. God's not in favor of it. And we better be careful. We better be careful we don't sympathize with it. We better be careful that we don't condone it. We better be careful that we don't forget what God says about sodomy. I want you to hear what Biden said yesterday. President Biden said Saturday, Pulse Nightclub. Anybody remember the Pulse Nightclub? <coughs> the 48 that were killed down there? <coughs> if you want to know what I really think of that, see me after church and I'll tell you. I can't tell you with this microphone on. But he said of this Pulse Nightclub thing is hallowed ground. I look up the word hallowed. It means to consecrate to a sacred use. Reverenced. Do you understand that this Pulse nightclub was a sodomite bar, a sodomite nightclub where sodomites went? That's what it was. Are you hearing me? 
They used to have a bar down here. I didn't see it this time when that's called the in-between bar. You know what that means? You're in between. You're neither male or female. I'm going to tell you what, dear friend, ladies and gentlemen, and you that are listening on the internet, you are either male or female. And if you don't know how, what, or when, just meet me in my office. I can explain it very simply to you. So he, he made the official site of the Pulse nightclub will become a national memorial. So what are we doing? We're lifting it up. We're making that lifestyle okay. We're making it to where we're supposed to accept it. Now, I don't know how all this works. I really don't. I want you to turn to Daniel just a couple pages over to Daniel chapter 11. I really don't know how all this works, Brother Jones. I, I'm, just, I, I'm just saying this could be it. How many of you believe Jesus Christ could come right now? How many of you believe that the devil is setting up the Antichrist? If you don't believe that, you got your head in the sand. Everything is pointing toward the Antichrist. Amen. The whole country, everything is pointing that direction. And in uh, Daniel chapter 11 and verse 37, it simply says this. Let me turn my page. Uh, Amen. Neither shall he, we're talking about the Antichrist, shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. Now I looked at that and I thought, well, the Antichrist does not desire women. Now to me, as a... I desire women. I de- woman, yes. I desire a woman. But what about a man that doesn't? What is that man? What would we call him? Well, a sodomite. So apparently, from what I'm just guessing, the Antichrist could be a sodomite. Would that surprise you with everything we're seeing today? I have never seen it become so weird today in our country. And it's all stems around sodomy. And everybody wants to accept it. Everybody wants to say it's all right. And everybody wants to get along with them. I'm telling you, friend, according to the Word of God, and if you don't know what the Bible says about it, just run run sodomy in your uh, uh, Google and, and look it up. I'm telling you, God hated it. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah over it. Uh, And in Romans chapter 1, he said those who are with women, with women, and man with man, he said they are stupid, they are dumb, they have forgotten what they knew was true, they've turned their backs on it, and the Bible said they're reprobate. Reprobate. So, how can we accept it? Joel said, hear this. Hear this. And then he commanded back in Joel, he commanded in verse 3, Tell your children of it. And let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Tell them what? That they've never seen it like this before. I tell you, we need to warn our kids. We need to warn our kids. We need to warn our grandkids. And if you have great grandkids, you need to warn them that sodomy is wicked, that sodomy is wrong. It'll never be accepted, amen, among God and how God looks at it. And since I'm on that, there's something else that just ticks me off. And that is Juneteenth. June the 19th was the day slaves were liberated. Thank God for that day. Many centuries ago, they they were freed. They've been freed ever since. They're free today. We don't need a Juneteenth, amen, to recognize them again. We have a month that we have a month that recognizes it. We have a, a holiday in Martin Luther King that recognizes it. We don't need a Juneteenth, but they are pushing for a national holiday for June the 19th. I say, boo! And all those that are for it, boo on you! We don't need, we don't need another holiday. 
Amen. In that regard. We have, a pen, we have Independence Day. That's a good day. July the 4th, independent everybody. Amen. Black, white, green, yellow, I don't care what you are. You were free. You have, a, you have the opportunities in this country that nobody else has. <clears throat> we don't need another day. And by the way, I'm up here at this stupid thing they're having, the country day up here, and country music. I want, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I wonder if John and I went in there and said, we'd like to have a gospel singing and block the streets for it and get Andy Leftwich and Travis Alltop and this guy's up here and have a gospel sing. And bring all your trinkets in and your trucks and your food trucks. And let's do all that for a gospel sing. They'd probably say, oh, there's no place on the calendar for it. But there is for a country singing. There is for a last weekend, last weekend, a rock and roll concert because somebody rode a bicycle. I'm sick of this. I am so sick. Je Jesus, would you please just take us all out of here? I'm ready. I am so ready for the, for the rapture of Christ. Joel commanded his children, the children's children, to what has been taking place in the land. In verse 5, look what he says. Awake! Amen. Hey, sleeper, it's Amen. time to wake up. Amen. This country is not for us. It's against us. And we need to wake up and we need to warn our children and we need to warn my church members, amen, that the world is starting to take over this thing. And we still need some people that will stand up for what is right. <clears throat> In verse 6, he compares these uh, palmer worms and these locusts and these canker worms and, and this caterpillar. He compares them in verse, five, or verse 6 to an army... He said, there, for a nation has come upon my land strong without number, whose teeth are like the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He's not talking about an army coming in like Babylon. He's talking about these insects. He said, they are like a great lion, an army of all these things. And they have come in, and they have destroyed the vine, and they have destroyed, amen, the fig tree. The vine and the fig tree in the Bible symbolizes God's blessings. And you know what these, these insects have done? They destroyed the blessings of God. You know what sin will do to us? It will destroy the blessings that God is trying to bless us with. That's why we got to stay on top of it. That's why we got to keep it confessed. That's why we got to turn from our wicked way and allow God, amen, to work in our lives so that this canker worm and this uh, locust and this palmer worm and this caterpillar won't, amen, destroy us from the inside out. That is what sin does, and it brings devastation to, to our homes and our lives. I tell you, you allow sin, amen, to go in your life uh, and a business will fold. You allow sin to, amen, partake in your life uh, and a marriage can end in divorce. I tell you what's worse than all that, death can come upon you. Because the wages of sin is death. This is what sin does. It eats away at us spiritually. It eats away at us emotionally. It eats away at us even physically. It's like a cancer to our bones or like rust to a car. Well, you start getting rust on a car, buddy, you're going to have to sand her down all the way to the bare metal, amen, to try and keep that rust from coming back. And that's the same way it is. You're going to get right with God. You're going to have to get right down to the bare metal. You're going to have to confess everything. You're going to have to sand on it. You're going to have to stay after it. Amen! Until you can get some victory in your life in this thing. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, how does a worm get inside of an apple? Maybe you say, well, uh, the worm burrows itself in the apple from the outside. No, you're wrong. The worm comes from the inside. An insect lays an egg in the apple blossom. And sometime later, that worm hatches in the heart of an apple. Then it eats its way out. And sin is just like that worm. It begins in the heart and it works out through a person's thoughts, 
through a person's words and through a person's actions. And by the way, I believe David said, I am a worm and no man. You're going to turn to worm food one day, dear friend. We all are. And that song, the worms crawl in, the worms crawl out, the worms play pinochle on my snout. That's going to come to pass, amen. It's bad, amen. Go to, go to James chapter 1. Keep your hand there and go to James. I don't want you to have to go back finding Joel. Go to James and let's read what James says in chapter 1. Now this isn't a message you're going to hear at the Presbyterian church this morning or the Methodists. They're not going to do this. But this is the kind of message you'll hear at a good, independent, Bible-believing Baptist church. In, in uh, James <clears throat> and chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away. You got that? Drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The desires, the desires are not sinful actions. It's when those desires are left unchecked and undealt with, that's when it becomes sin. It's not, ba it, it, it's not the bad thought that you have. And we all have bad thoughts. It's not dealing with the bad thought that leads to sin. That is the problem. There's a reason why Paul said, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. When he said, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Hey, you have a bad thought. You labor on that thing. You know what to do. It start to grow in there. You labor it, you just let it grow. And then you know what you do? You imagine it even worse than what it is. It becomes more than what it was. And it continues to grow until outside, outwardly, you start doing things. Things that ain't right. Things you know that ain't right. Things that you say, oh, I'll never get caught. Things that you do. No one knows I'm doing this. I'm going to tell you something. There is a God in heaven. And God knows everything. God sees everything. Am I right about that? Does, does anybody not believe that? God sees. God knows. God hears every single thing. And when you leave it go, or you let it go, it just begins to move in there until one day it's going to pop out. And that's what the worm does in an apple. Next time you bite in an apple, you see a worm in there. He didn't go in from the outside. He came from the inside. In verses 8 through 13, we see now, we saw the, the sin destroys. 8 through 13, Joel gives them a call to repentance. Boy, that's what we need. Amen? Amen. We need some repentance. Amen. You know, repentance is turning. It's going in the right direction, away from the wrong direction. Notice some words with me in verse 8. Lament. Look in verse 11. Be ye ashamed. The second line in verse 11. How? That's H-O-W-L. In verse 13, gird yourselves and lament. I looked that verse up. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. And that was interpreted. I saw it interpreted this way. It's like an engaged girl whose intended husband was taken from her before the wedding. Now, think about that. Think about And we've read stories like that where a couple was engaged and a man was in a wreck and died before the wedding took place. That's what it's like. That's, that's why he says, repent, lament. Cry about it. Put on sackcloth. Hey, your sin should bother you. And, and verse 9, the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off. In verse 10, the field is wasted. The corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil is gone. In verse 11, the harvest is perished. In verse 12, the vine, 
the fig tree, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree, the apple tree. All the trees are withered. And in verse 13, he calls on them to howl, to lament, amen, all night, to lie in sackcloth and to cry out and repent of the sin that they have done before God. And I tell you something, church, we need to do some repentance. We need to do some more of this turning from our ways, amen, and turning our hearts to God. Some of you have not having victory in your life. It's because you got caught with something and you never repented of it. You just got caught. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You got caught before you ever got caught. God saw it. Let me say God. God's purpose in calling us to repent is so that we might be brought back into the right relationship with Him. That's why. God doesn't want to condemn us. He wants to redeem us. Sin puts up a wall that prevents us from having a right relationship with Him. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. If there's sin in your life, you have a wall between you and God. Sin prevents us from living a victorious and abundant life. That's what sin does. God is calling us to come to Him and to confess our sin and turn from our unrighteousness. Don't wait till tomorrow. Do it today. Amen. Repent of your evil ways, your evil thoughts, your evil doings. Repent. Turn. And then in verses 14 through 20, it's a call to prayer. Look what he says. Verse 14, sanctify you fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land of the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. Amen. A cry unto the Lord. In order to repent, we need to pray. Joel pleads with the people to come together to the house of the Lord. That's what I'm doing this morning. I'm pleading the people to come together to the house of the Lord and to cry and to howl and to repent and to repray. In today's world, it's not about repentance. It's about our feelings. In today's world, it's not about prayer. It's about going out for coffee. In our, our world today, it's not about sanctification. It's about making money. In our world today, it's not, it's not the cleaning of our hearts, but keeping the carpet clean. God is calling us to pray for restoration. Jeremiah, last verse, Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah in chapter 29. I read this in my Bible just a few days ago as I'm going through the book of Jeremiah. Boy, what a great book it is. Jeremiah chapter 29. Are we okay this morning? Yeah. Made anybody mad? Good. Didn't mean to. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. What's he says? For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Isn't that something? God knows the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye search me or search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity. And I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whether I have driven uh, you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again to the place whence I cause you to be carried away captive. Now practically, let me say it's this way. God wants to hear you. God wants you to repent. God will hear your prayers. And God will forget your past and he'll bring you back to the place where you need to be. Their captivity here was Babylon. Our captivity is sin and living in sin. God does not want to condemn us. He wants to restore us. He's not pointing a finger. He's holding out a hand. He doesn't want to send us away. He wants to draw us near to Him. He doesn't want you to hold sin over our heads. He wants you to throw sin in the sea of God's forgetfulness. The wages of sin. It destroys. There's a call for repentance. And there's a time to pray. Like termites or locusts, sin can eat away at our spiritual life and cause us to collapse.
I've talked to several of you in here, and you've shared with me some of the deepest things of your heart. And I cannot repeat those things. I, I, I trust, you have to trust me for the confidence that you have in me. That what you tell me, I don't, I, I'm not going to preach from this pulpit. But some of you are experienced collapses in some of your loved ones' lives. You are. I'm afraid we're about to experience a very grave thing in our lives. And it'll be a very hard thing for us to deal with. But we will deal with it. We will not sympathize to it. We will not say it's okay. We will separate. We will put God first. And if, and if this... Some people think that uh, why this went off. Some people think that the Christian life, is, when you get saved, it just becomes real easy. But that's wrong. Every rose has thorns. There's things we have to bear that we're not, we don't like, we're not comfortable with. 
But for the sake of the gospel and the sake of your testimony, you have to do what's right. Right? 